Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Very good day to you. Welcome to another edition of Pregnancy to Parenting. I'm Khawa Solomon. Stay with us for the next hour or so. Please join us for a repeat on this show. And uh, if you want your friends, your family to listen and watch rather around the world and over the seas, then you can audio stream, rather live stream on www.itvnetworks.tv. Today we talk about nutrition and once again we have to realize that it's something that starts at home with yourself and I know mommies you guys are so bu busy and you're running around um, but please see if it's a date, if it's some raisins or some fruit that you've packed in your bag, carry your bottle of water, you are the first example and when the children see you doing it they will inshallah be part of that process. So today we're back, uh, have, we, we, we have back in studio um, our representative from Nutripeds who's our uh, clinical dietitian specializing in uh, pediatrics and that is Kath McGraw. Thank you so much for joining us once again today. Thanks for having me back. So nutrition is so vast we need to break it down mm. and we've got down to um, basic nutrition for little ones for infants down to toddler nutrition and now moving on to something more specialized and I'm very excited to follow up with uh, some of these shows when we talk about fussy eating and feeding sick babies but today specifically we will be chatting about preemie nutrition and also the food allergy issues that that for me is, is a big thing so um, to be cautious already when you start feeding so take us through the first steps when it comes to preemie babies kindly elaborate on the special needs of premature babies and what does it exactly mean to be a premature baby yeah that's it's something that no mom really expects to have but mm -hmm. it's a reality that a lot, lot of moms will have to face um, and with that is quite scary because you have this picture in your mind I'm going to have my baby I'm going to feed my baby like this mm -hmm. and you picture at the breast and nursing your baby and suddenly your baby's born early and you're told that you can't nurse your baby your baby's lying there got drips up um, got feeding tubes mm -hmm. in and that's the reality of feeding your premature baby it's initially not going to look how you pictured it but really I would like to encourage moms that if they work closely together with the doctors and the nursing staff. Um, they can definitely reach their goal of eventually nursing and breastfeeding. But the critical thing is because in the beginning that prem baby has come too early, their little guts are underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. That third trimester inside the womb is the time when that gut matures mm -hmm. because they're drinking that amniotic fluid. And that amniotic fluid has got a whole lot of factors in it that actually mature the digestive system. There, it's not just water. We always talk about our waters breaking and you have this picture of H2O trickling out, but it's actually nutrition. It's a whole lot of gut nutrition that is in that amniotic fluid. And one of the, for example, proteins in mm. there is called glutamine. And that's the protein that is like the bodybuilder of the gut. Now, when the mm. baby's born early, they lack, they don't get that. They mm -hmm. don't get the benefit of that. But what is exciting is that your breast milk does also have high doses of glutamine in it. Okay. And so that okay. is why we say to moms, please, we want your breast milk. Mm. And that's one of the biggest things you can do for your prem baby mm. is to give breast milk to the unit so that your baby can be fed on breast milk. Um, and what that means for you is resting like you would if you had your baby with you. Just because you haven't been able to take your baby home doesn't mean now you've got a few extra months free um, while you wait for your baby to come home. You really need to go and try and spend as much time as what you can mm. with your baby because that's also going to encourage breast milk production. You need to rest as much as possible because that will definitely help and make sure that your nutrition is sound. Like you say, it starts with the mom. Mm. And so lots of rest, good nutrition, and lots of water and liquid is really, really important. And resting literally means just taking time out of life and just putting your feet up, sleeping more hours, um, not running around, not attending every social function, one or two and leaving earlier, and then just spending lots of time on your bed in a quiet space mm. where you can just kind of recuperate after this birth experience. Um, and then provide the unit with breast milk for your baby. So when we talk about rest, and you've mentioned all of that, sometimes just a 15 minute nap is good enough for some moms. Okay, I feel revived, mm. let me get up and go. Yes. That's not good enough. No, absolutely. Okay. It's more than what you would normally need mm. because your body is going to be producing all these extra amount of calories. Now, because the baby is premature, 
the baby's going to probably need more than what your breast milk can just after. Okay. So breast milk is ideal on what we want, but mm -hmm. what we have is we've got added supplements that we often add to the breast milk mm -hmm. to enhance it, especially when it comes to the protein. The protein in breast milk is not adequate for the, the prem baby. It's adequate for the full term baby, okay. but not for the prem baby. That's because the prem baby has different needs to mm -hmm. the full term baby. And so breast is best, yes, but breast milk is aimed at your term baby. The breast, the, the express breast milk of moms with prem babies mm -hmm. is slightly different. So the body even does make some adaption towards the prem baby, but it's still not ideal because having a prem baby is not ideal. It's not how okay. it should have been. So if you do find in the unit where mm -hmm. your baby is that they add in something to the breast milk, which we call a breast milk fortifier, don't panic and think now your baby's getting formula. It's very specifically aimed at the prem baby. Mm -hmm. It's a very gentle type of protein. It's a very gentle type of vitamins and minerals. Mm -hmm. And it's really wonderful in helping maintain the baby's blood sugar. Now, we know that being born has but being born too early has certain implications in light of all of this that special requirement um, nutritional requirement with regards to the extra fluid that's going into baby mm. is it you've mentioned it's, it's a type of milk mixture mm. so it really is we've got a powder in South mm. Africa internationally you can get more liquid base but we use powder here okay. and we've only got one option in South Africa and it's a good option and we use that and we add it to our breast milks okay um, and the mom, so what we are asking moms to do is to express breast milk. Mm. So they have to learn how to pump. And that's sometimes a huge challenge for moms because that's, you know, it's difficult enough to pump if you have a term baby. Now mm. you've got a new baby and you've got to pump and then you've got to bring it into the unit, you've got to store it. But most units have good storage places for moms, good um, containers in which they'll give moms. So don't be scared. Speak to your doctor about mm. that. Speak to the midwife, the nursing staff whoever is assisting and supporting you, mm. the lactation consultant that's available from the hospital, mm. or let or organize someone to come in to assist mm. you. Um, and that, that's, those are little things that can make a huge difference is having the right breast pump, because that's going to enable you to get adequate amount of breast milk out. It's not just about what you put in and the rest and that, but also how are you going to express mm. it. And with mm. regards to feeding, mm. um, babies that are not able to suck or latch on premature little ones, does that affect um, the nutrition as well? Do they get also the added um, drip <laughs> yeah. uh, intravenous uh, with regards to that part of that, of that nutrition um, that is needed? I think what's also important is to define prematurity. So mm -hmm. we get our microprems, which are really born under 28 weeks of age, or those that are very, very small um, for, birth, for birth weight. And then we get our kind of our premature age group between 28 weeks and 34 weeks. Mm. And then we get our much bigger prems, which are 34 to 36 to 36 to 38 weeks. And then post kind of 36, mm. we will consider more term. So our, our babies that are born really tiny, like under 28 weeks, they've got a whole lot of host of other issues like breathing issues. Mm. And, um, and we actually don't want to be fiddling with them and touching them and handling them too much. Um, that's also really, really important because they do lose body heat really quickly okay. and they burn up energy really quickly. Their fluid requirements, the amount of liquid they need per body weight is very, very high. Just as an example, a prem that's born under 28 weeks might need up to 200 mils per kilogram of mm -hmm. fluid versus a full-term baby that needs about 100 to 120 kilograms and mils per kilogram. Yeah. So you can see that there's quite a big difference. So we do have a lot of fluid we have to get into this little baby okay. um, for their weight. So th that's not always met with mom's breast milk mm. in the beginning. And so their blood sugars are also very unstable because they've got a whole change. They're not supposed to be outside the womb at the moment. Mm. So that's also what we have to keep remembering. So when you see the doctor prescribing, the dietitian prescribing TPN, which means that the baby's going to be fed food by the veins, okay. that's a good thing. It's not bad and it's not going to affect long-term health of your baby. Mm. It's actually going to help your baby to grow because one of the critical factors is that they get all their nutrition in quite aggressively okay. in the beginning. And we know that that is very, very important. So your breast milk should then be given as early on as possible mm. and in units 
that are up to speed and up to date will be given it from day one mm. that little bit of colostrum just even wets in the tongue with mm. it because it causes that wonderful bacteria to grow okay. that they've missed out on because um, you know they were born too early so it really is so important that you give us as much even if you think it's only five mils mm. that five mils makes a huge difference because maybe we're only prescribing one mil every six hours wow. so <laughs> five mils is a whole day's feed-in um, so it's worth it every drop counts <laughs> when okay. it comes to your prem <laughs> wow didn't realize that and we know that they're tiny but um, little bits at a time i'm sure that yeah. what, what makes a difference we want to talk about the the common challenges after the break when it comes to feeding um, in our premature babies as well as taking our premies home and what issues they can possibly come um, when we do take them home. More after the short break. Stay with us on Nutrition. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back, a very good day and thank you so much for joining us once again as we talk about premature nutrition and allergy sufferers. So babies at the beginning when you start weaning, what should you know, what shouldn't you know, what can you do and what can't you do? Um, so stay tuned for that. With me is Kath McGall from uh, Nutripeds, uh, who is our pediatric dietitian in studio with us and just before the break she elaborated on what's really happening with regards to feeding uh, your premature baby in the hospital. Okay, so now we want to talk about um, challenges, any sort of nutritional challenges in hospital, and then maybe when you take baby home, what do we need to know about that premature baby and what needs to be established before baby can be taken home? So in hospital, the challenges is that your baby's gut, like I said, is underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they, you know, there can be some gut issues with regards to feeding. And that's why we really ask for your breast milk, because that definitely has low incidence and low risk mm -hmm. of gut issues. Um, there are very good preterm formulas that are available. So if mom is totally unable to breastfeed and we're not able to get um, enough express breast milk from mom or enough of donor breast milk mm -hmm. and donor breast milk because it's it's not in a huge abundance these cutoff points with regards to the kilograms so if the bigger the baby is the less chance they have of getting donor breast milk okay. um, so even though you buy the donor breast milk you have to have certain criteria and sure. certain age of prematurity so a baby that's kind of 34 weeks and at a good birth weight for 34 weeks is unlikely going to get any donor breast mm. milk but their gut is still immature so we still want breast milk so that's one of the major challenges the other thing is that because um their baby if, especially if they were micro prems they they weren't able to be latched initially at the breast that okay. would just burn up too much energy it'd be counterproductive mm. And so we do feed them via tubes. Mm. Um, the tubes can go through their mouth, oral gastric tubes, which mm -hmm. is quite nice. So it doesn't go through their nasal passage. Um, later on, we straight might into their tummy. So straight into their tummy. Okay. Um, and later on, we might put it through their nose okay. passages. Um, and we try and do that for as short a time as possible because you can just imagine with, with tubes going down the back of your throat, learning mm. to suck and learning to swallow is all quite unpleasant. Yeah. And that can itself cause some feeding issues and feeding aversions where they don't really want to um, suck. And we can speak more about that when mm. we speak about fussy feeding. But that's one of the challenges that we might face. If a baby is not bottle feeding or breast feeding before, they aren't able to go home because we won't send a baby mm -hmm. home with a tube in. Mm -hmm. So okay. because it's just too risky because we mm -hmm. want to make sure, like you say, the tube's going into the stomach. We want to make sure the tube is placed safely in the stomach, mm -hmm. not in any other part of the body. So that's one of the reasons that would prevent going home is if the baby's not fully breastfeeding because they've got to be able to, mom's got to manage her and the baby on their own without tubes and Absolutely. all that sort of thing. And also the baby's weight. You know, we would like the baby to have gained a reasonable amount of weight. There's no, there's no particular weight. We can't say every baby needs to gain three kilograms or mm. two kilograms or double their weight. So it really depends on baby and how they are doing. Okay. Um, so if they can feed, if they've gained on their own, if they've gained sufficient weight, mm -hmm. um, and if their their iron levels are good, a lot of um, 
prems need a blood transfusion just to increase their iron because sure. they're not just their body's not they're mature enough to make sufficient iron. Mm. Um, so there's a number of factors that we want to make sure. Sometimes they had a high risk of getting a jaundice and we want to make sure that that is resolved. Um, yeah, so there's a number of factors that will affect readiness okay. to go home. And, and then the challenge when you take your baby home, I think one of the challenges, and this might sound strange, is in the hospital, we are so focused and um, just as much on weight gain and growth. Mm. We want this baby to grow and that's important. And I find that we almost have to calm mom down a bit and calm ourselves down towards discharge because we don't want to keep pumping calories mm. forever in a day because there's actually a risk of obesity later on in life in premature babies. They're, mm. high, they're one of our risk groups for obesity because they get, tend to get overfed. Mm. So just as much as we need to feed them aggressively, we also know, got to know when to stop. So mm. what I do is I make sure that they get back onto their growth curve that they were born on, or at least close to it. Okay. And then I don't push them, then I start to slow it down and just let them grow on that curve. So I don't mm. keep pushing them up and up and up. Even if they were born a bit lower than what maybe ideally we would have liked, we okay. just want them on their birth growth curve. Mm. And that's quite important for moms, and it's a message I'd like them to hear, because often they'll go to a clinic and they get told the baby must get onto that 50th centile, you know, mm. that middle growth curve. But their baby was born, say, on the 10th growth curve. Okay. And I would just be happy just if that baby keeps curve. growing on the 10th mm. because research has shown that if we push that baby to the 50th, then the chance of obesity, rebound mm. obesity later on in life is very high. And of course, the importance is that, that it is increasing. Exactly. We want to, and just increasing. consistently growing on his curve or her curve. Mm. So that is another challenge that a mom might face. A, a quick question, quickly. How do they exactly wear the babies when they are in the incubator? <laughs> We've got amazing incubators. So okay. You can actually wear them in the incubator. Oh, nice. Yeah, so okay. you press a button and then you press a button again. That's amazing. It, it is amazing. You can read all the information all right. and that. Just. That was just a question that popped up there for me now. <laughs> they're, they're lovely. They're computer-based. Mm. And, and not all incubators are like that, but they are in a lot of the hospitals have those incubators. Okay. Because you try and, again, touch the baby as little as possible. So you don't yes. necessarily wear them in the up, beginning yeah. every day mm. um, but if you've got a way in incubator then you can weigh and assess them Brilliant. obviously if they've got tubes and pipes and that it's not always accurate but mm. you're more looking at consistency over time and initially the prem baby is going to lose weight and they can lose up to 10 percent of their weight um, and then we have to start regaining it now but that's not that's not a worry to say that something's going wrong. no it's not but we do want to we do want to try and aggressively feed them so we prevent as much weight loss as what we can okay um, in the beginning yeah so common uh, problems and issues around being at home that mom could possibly okay. um, that, that could possibly arise when they um, are feeding and when it comes to nutrition and baby prim baby now at home I think that firstly is that your baby's still prim, even though mm -hmm. you've taken your baby home. So your baby might have reached term, but they've been around for a lot longer. So mm -hmm. they've been faced with maybe tubes in their nose, tubes down their throat, you know, tubes to breathe, pricks, regular blood tests. Mm -hmm. They've had a lot done to them. There's a lot written about the um, nursery environment and the, especially the ICU baby environment okay. and the bright lights and that. So routine is, is a challenge sometimes to get into a routine and a routine and rhythm of feeding can mm -hmm. be a challenge I normally say to moms continue with the hospital routine when you go home to start with okay. and then as you settle and you get in used to this little person being in your space and mm -hmm. and in your home and yet you hundred percent responsible now for this person mm -hmm. you can start to adapt the routine the other thing is that you might find that you now want to switch over to breastfeeding and your baby is a little bit more um, you know, aversive to doing that because they've been maybe been bottle fed because that's what had to happen because a mom can't be with her baby 24-7 mm. in the neonatal unit. So they get the breast milk then through the bottle to mm. prepare them to go home. Um, in an ideal world, we would all want all moms rooming in um, kangaroo care in their babies, Absolutely. skin to skin and breastfeeding and kind of never having a bottle. But we don't have those facilities in all our hospitals. So we have to kind of weigh up the whole big picture mm. and like I said in one of the previous shows it's more than just the nutrition it's also about the emotional and the social and the, the sensory environment so I think if a mom has managed to give us breast milk and even if the baby's taken it via the bottle mm. and she can start to encourage breastfeeding at home 
um, at least we we are a step in the right direction. And then get a lactation consultant in okay. to help you reestablish. And it's amazing how quickly babies they are not hardcore ones. Mm. They can adapt. They can change. They can learn the breast again. It just takes a lot of time and patience in some cases. Some babies they just latch on no problem. Mm. Um, but it's it really that that is probably one of your biggest challenges um, when you when you're working with the prem. And another one is also moms don't always know how to progress the feeds because of okay. the age. Do they correct for age? Do mm. they use actual age? Um, like when it comes to weaning, do I wean my baby actual age? Do I wean my baby yes. corrected age? And what I would say is really just keep having dialogue with your care, healthcare professionals. Because yeah. to make a blanket statement, corrected age or actual age is difficult because some mm. babies mature quicker, others don't. Um, but normally when it comes to solids, we say definitely correct for age. Um, especially in your micro prems because mm. they are just too young if they've been actual age four months but they're mm. only corrected age three weeks you don't really want sure. to start solids <laughs> at that sort of stage oh, but yeah don't make that decision on your own do it with okay. people that are can help you and guide you with that decision I'm so glad that you've mentioned you know the social and emotional aspects of taking a premature home mm. because one doesn't re realize I was looking at a young couple the other day and um, this mother was hovering over her baby because the little kids were down. But um, yeah, moms mm. actually really go through a lot and understanding mm. that you, you you can speak to somebody, even if it's mm. your clinic sister mm. or um, you know your GP, mm. talk to somebody if you're having issues. And I think that will definitely help you along with mm. struggling because you're, you're definitely not alone in this. And with regards to the weaning, I just want to chat, mm. ch chat about that quickly before we go um, for an ad break. Um, and you say you don't do that on your own always mm. with consultation mm. and uh, your pediatrician nutritionist mm. would be advisable to check mm. with um, and is it always around the gestation age of the baby when baby was born um, then when baby you know was meant to be born mm. now that gets confusing yeah I think yes yeah, so the actual age is like that the baby was born at 28 weeks yeah. um, and they're kind of four weeks they're four months old, but actually corrected ages, they're only three weeks old, really. Okay. So when it comes to weaning, we definitely want to look at both ages and we want to get closer to the age where the baby is four months as if they had been born full term. Mm. So because that means the gut is mature at that level. Um, but definitely do it under guidance as, as to with your clinic mm. or your pediatrician or a pediatric dietitian as to when you're going to introduce your baby okay. to the solids, just to and get some good guidance. And it would probably be on the same um, sort of line when you would, with regards to foods, um, when you are to start a normal uh, term baby Correct. with the uh, porridge and little bits at a time and like we did last week. Yeah, so you would definitely, you could do veggies and fruit and mm. all those normal things that you would do. All right. Yeah. Well, there was so much to talk about when it comes to Premier Nutrition, so stay with us. We'll continue more after this break and uh, hopefully we'll touch on allergies more after this. Stay with us. Welcome back, Assalamu alaikum. A very good day to you. We have dietitian in studio with us, Kath Magor, and uh, you can visit their website, nutripeds.co.za, for more information. They've got um, a great website, Interactive Highlights, uh, what is happening this week and what, they sh what you should be talking about, and questions. Post them on, uh, on, on their page. Don't forget to like Pregnancy to Parenting page. Please do comment, uh, send through your questions and queries and we will add it through to our next production, inshallah. So more on premies, anything else that we still need to discuss? I mean, when we think about premature babies, they're also prone to um, so much infections and, and, and illnesses and, and medication or whatever um, that goes around that. So bringing up the, the issue of allergies, are they then more prone to allergies and how could that possibly be linked to being a premature baby? And uh, now we will open the topic of allergies as well. Yeah, but I mean, your prem babies are definitely at a high risk of um, infections, mm. with respiratory infections, particularly because their lungs, you know, aren't always matured. Yeah. Um, 
from an allergy point of view, because of the whole gut issue, and mm. because there's definitely a gut component when it comes to allergies, Pen babies are at a slightly high risk, not a hugely high risk, mm. but they definitely pose a potentially high risk. And also if they weren't able to um, breastfeed because of various reasons, yeah. not every mom is able to express and meet the needs of her, mm. her growing prem. Um, that also would put them at a slightly higher risk of allergies. So, And then the other thing that a prem is really um, at a risk of is more reflux. Okay. And that can sometimes also be linked to allergies. Mm as well so the guidelines around allergies what are the basic rules concerning babies um, who are specifically born into a family that um, has risks to to food allergies or even um, eczema because that's that, a big thing that is big when I see a skin rash and some dryness that's yeah. you have eczema <laughs> yeah <laughs> and I think that's such a good question because we, we talk in so much more these days about your thousand days which we spoke yes. about in one of our shows as well and Cape, that Cape Town, Cape Embrace comes up for me. <laughs> yeah. And basically what's, what's the allergies, it follows that same pathway. So if okay. you fall pregnant and you have allergies and um, the, your partner has allergies mm. or you've got a family history of allergies, you actually want to then kind of work at exposing your baby, this might sound really strange, to mm. as many of the allergens as possible. And your top allergens would be the common ones like egg, fish, wheat, nuts, peanuts, soya, cow's milk. Mm. Okay, so, so in the past we used to tell moms if you're, if you're at risk or if your baby's at risk, you want to avoid these allergens altogether. Mm. And now we are saying no, actually early exposure um, will build tolerance to it as opposed to removing it. And then when you finally give it, it's a foreign substance to your baby mm. and they then their body, your their bodies attack it as a foreign substance because allergies is linked to the whole immune system. And when you say early exposure, how early is that when they start weaning? So from pregnancy. Okay. So we don't want you to, for example, we used to tell pregnant moms avoid peanuts mm -hmm. during pregnancy. Please don't avoid peanuts during pregnancy. <laughs> if, however, okay. it's your allergen, please avoid it. <laughs> okay. Of so, but if it's if you don't have an allergen to a particular food, but maybe mm. you've got a bit of an allergic history, like your mother tells you as a child you couldn't have cow's milk, you know that will give you a little warning bell that your little one may just follow your pathway. Mm. So make sure that you do eat on a regular basis those allergen foods and include them as part of your diet mm. in your, during your pregnancy because they get exposure to them in the womb. And then while you're breastfeeding, also make sure that you are going to expose your baby. So continue eating your peanuts, continue eating your cow's milk protein. And you would only stop those foods if your baby showed allergic signs. Okay. Then you might remove them out of your diet, but only if they, your baby shown allergic signs, which might be excessive diarrhea, skin rash, as you mentioned, mm. eczema, projectile vomiting, Sometimes really bad reflux is mm. related to a cow's milk protein allergy. And if mom's remove cow's milk protein from her diet, her breast milk will then be cow's milk protein free and the babies often do much better. Mm. But then when you're going to wean, you know that your baby's got a risk of the cow's milk protein allergy. However, if removing the cow's milk protein from your diet mm. makes no difference to your baby's symptoms, okay. put it back, back in. in. Okay. okay. You know, it's something else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's interesting that you, you specify um, cow's milk protein and not cow's milk. So I want to break that down quickly okay. and also understand what the differences is between food intolerance okay. and just being sensitive to certain um, uh, food items and how that dif differs from an actual food allergy. Mm. So, so I mentioned the cow's milk protein because mm. people get often confused with lactose intolerance yes. and cow's milk protein allergy. Those are two very different things. Mm. Lactose is the sugar found in cow's milk and in breast milk, actually all mammal milk, goat's milk, okay. buffalo milk, camel milk, cow's milk and, and human milk oh. all contain lactose in different quantities, actually with breast milk being the highest lactose. Mm. So if your child is lactose intolerant, that means they don't have an enzyme to break that sugar down and they actually lack that enzyme. Now, a very, very small percent of the population are pr have primary lactose intolerant. We, we say a lot of babies are lactose intolerant. We use mm -hmm. it as a standard diagnosis, but very, very few are actually. They might just not produce 
large quantities of the enzyme yeah. or in the beginning their guts are mature and they don't have enough of the enzyme but over time it meets the demand so as okay. there's a demand there's this much lactose your body produces this much enzyme mm. you drop the lactose the body drops the enzyme okay. so removing lactose out of the diet is not always the best idea so that's the intolerance side of mm. the sugar it's got nothing to do with the protein it's got nothing to do with an allergy okay. so cow's milk protein is the actual allergen which mm. is found in cow's milk but it's not found in human milk mm. and it's the cow's milk protein will be different to what's found in goat's, goat's milk, milk to what's found in camel milk and actually cow's milk protein they've got 22 proteins in cow's milk of which you will be familiar with the names casein and whey protein okay. you know little miss muffet sat on a tuffet yes. eating a curds yes. which is casein okay. and whey which is that watery substance that you find on top of the yogurt remember we mm -hmm. used to throw it off that's all the nutrition now that whey protein is a cow's milk protein and the casein is a cow's milk protein. Okay. Now moms also make whey and casein naturally in their mm -hmm. breast milk. And the way a mom makes, babies tolerate really, really well. Mm. What babies sometimes don't tolerate is the cow's milk proteins that come through her breast milk. Mm. And so that's what the baby does. And the lactose from the cow's milk the moms drink Sugar. makes no difference to what lactose is in her breast milk. Her body makes its own lactose. <laughs> does it make really sense? Really ed educational session. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't make sense. I just have to break it down a bit slow to process here. Yeah. But it's interesting because now um, the question comes up for me of um, hearing people say, oh, no, I'm lactose intolerant, mm. but they um, they have ice cream and yogurt mm. and <laughs> all of these dairy products. Or I'm allergic to dairy, but what about dairy am I allergic to? Is yeah. it the entire enzymes, you know, growing that, that's yeah. within the... And understanding what, what the allergens are. So yeah. that, that's also another subject yeah. to discuss, eh? And I think, I think it's, it's the, the two are interchanged. Mm. Moms will say, you know, my child's lactose intolerance, but if you ask them a little bit further, you realize their child's actually showing a cow's milk protein allergy, okay. not a lactose intolerance. And if the mom says, my, cow's, my child's cow's milk allergic, mm. you know, then so it's, it's a difficult thing to tease out. Yeah. Um, but basically, lactose intolerance means that a baby would tolerate cow's milk protein and they would just need a lactose free milk. Okay. But they wouldn't actually tolerate breast milk because you can't make breast milk lactose free. <laughs> so when a mom okay. says to me, the child is lactose intolerant and they've cut cow's milk out of their diet mm. but the baby's drinking breast milk then i know what she means is the baby's actually cow's milk protein allergic mm. it's fine with lactose but it's but it's also important that we as moms need to understand it absolutely instead of saying that you know my you know there's lactose in, in the breast it's milk exactly. but they're lactose intolerant it yeah. doesn't make sense exactly. so it's, it's, it's very important on shows like this that we need to you know elaborate and and, mm. and detail explain that so lactose being the sugars within the correct um milk. and that is in every single milk even breast milk absolutely okay. and you can't remove it out of breast milk you can okay. so if your baby's tolerating breast milk your then baby's not lactose, lactose intolerant. Okay. But if your baby's tolerating breast milk only when you remove cow's milk from your diet, yeah. which tells me your baby might have a cow's milk protein allergy. Okay, so that's cow's milk Correct. protein allergy. And that's very important to understand because if your baby is lactose intolerant, your baby can't have lactose, can't have breast milk, can't have cow's milk with lactose in it. Mm. But if your baby's cow's milk allergic, that means your baby can drink your breast milk, hmm. but that means you're not going to wean your baby onto a cow's milk protein formula. You're yeah. going to have to find another formula that's got no cow's milk protein yeah. in it. Substitute soya or something. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you've mentioned some of the common um, uh, food allergies yes. uh, that could possibly um, harm your baby. And if you know you're allergic to it, then mommy stay away. Otherwise, start eating from okay. eating of it um, when you're pregnant already. So looking at now finding out the, the and, and, and as explained, chatting to mom about lactose and the difference mm. between the two. So now understanding what sort of tests need to be done and how are the tests done? Um, do they do they specifically do milk protein? Do they do a dairy? Do they do lactose? Mm. Just explain and, and how important are those tests that needs to be done? Okay, if it's for an intolerance or if it's for, for example, if, if a doctor is concerned that your child is lactose intolerant, mm. um, some of the signs of a pure lactose intolerant child will be that they can't absorb any of the, the lactose. So they become very malnourished. They often end up very okay. dehydrated. They have severe diarrhea. They normally always end up in hospital. 
And um, when you test their stool, their stools are very frothy. They look like froth. Mm. And um, when you test their stool, you find a lot of lactose in their stool okay. because it's not broken down. And so and, it just and causes lactose is that, that frothy that sugar to come. Yeah, it's a sugar in the milk. Okay, we, we, I want to touch more on that because this, this topic is getting really interesting. Understanding what tests need to be done, and. Uh, talking to Kath McGuire, our nutritionist, uh, in studio with us, and allergies. Allergies and nutrition, tricky subject, but important to know. Back in a moment, stay with us. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back. A very good day to you and thank you so much for joining us and staying with us. This program is really getting interesting, throwing us completely um, off what we had originally scheduled for. But more importantly, we're talking about what you need to know and we're going to be elaborating as much as we can. Please do ask any questions, submit them on our Pregnancy to Parenting page and we'll try, try and direct it or you can go directly to nutripeeds.co.za um, and uh, find out from Kath and her team how they can help you. So Kath, looking at lactose intolerance and milk protein allergens, we stop somewhere with taking the, 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 the correct test, what sort of test, um, and then also the symptoms. So the poo, uh, frothy poo, haven't seen it yet, lucky me, mm -hmm. but um, if we need to identify the symptoms, what are they? So what you'll find, let's just to recap, if you're looking at a, a lactose intolerant, yeah. you're going to look at a child that isn't thriving, not growing very well. Okay. Um, a child whose stools have, who has excessive diarrhea, mm -hmm. excessive bloating and gas, a lot of flatulence, a lot of gas, very uncomfortable baby, very, mm. very unhappy baby. Um, and when you test the stool, so you'd send the stool sample away and they test it for what we call reducing substances. So your doctor might mention those words. Okay. And basically what he's saying is we're going to test it for sugars in the stool. Right. And he's going to test if there's lactose present. Mm. And depending on them, there will be a bit of lactose present in most baby stools. But if there's a large amount of lactose present, which is the milk sugar, then we're going to assume then that the baby's not producing that enzyme that breaks down the milk sugar okay. so that it gets absorbed as opposed to just goes out with the stool. Mm. So that's the test for lactose intolerance. If that comes back negative mm. and your baby's still having a lot of discomfort with regards to baby diarrhea, baby constipation. And you've admitted the... the you've admitted yeah. the lactose now. Vomiting, mm. reflux. Um, those are, those are potential signs, and p possibly eczema as well. Okay. Those are potential signs of cow's milk protein allergy. Mm. Okay, so, th so similar diarrhea yeah. is across both, but with regards to your um, cow's milk protein allergy baby, what you'll find is the stools aren't frothy, they're more mucousy. Okay. So it looks like strands, your baby swallowed all the mucus yes, that he yes. could, and there's long, thick strands of mucus Common in the, in the stool. Common in the first, first, first stools, the green... Um, yes, yeah. but that's, that's normally green quite... Mucus and that normally is just a more mucus-based okay. stool. But it shouldn't then persist afterwards. Okay. Then it shows that if the gut is producing a lot of mucus, mm. that there's something bothering the gut. Because okay. remember, our, our immune system produces mucus to fight off pathogens or bacteria and viruses yes, yes, yes. and things that shouldn't be there okay. and so if your body is allergic to the cow's milk protein your baby's body he's going the body's going to produce more mucus in the gut to mm. quite try and fight it and you're going to find that mucus in the stools mm. and so that will be a warning bell and so your doctor might consider that that's a potential chance of uh, allergy um eczema um is is a sign uh, yeah um and then Projectile vomiting or very bad reflux mm. could also be a sign. Constipation, so it might not be diarrhea, it might be constipation, mm. could also be a sign of cow's milk protein allergy. And the best test is actually to and remove... not lactose. Not lactose. Okay. The best test is to remove cow's milk protein. Mm. If you breastfeed in from your diet, um, you do that for two weeks. So clear your milk for two weeks. Don't eat any dairy, so no cheese. No yogurt, no ice cream, no cow's milk. 
not whether it's cooked, baked, in your tea, anything. You have absolutely no cow's milk whatsoever. You can use no, rice milk, just milk. You cows, can use soya milk, milk, just cow's milk. Goat's milk? Don't don't substitute with goat's milk. It just confuses everything. It's in the same sort of spectrum. Yeah. yeah. It's got similar similar cut proteins mm. in it. So just stick to a non mammal milk. Okay. And while you are busy trying out and test. So you spend two weeks dairy free in your diet if you're a breastfeeding mom. If your baby's on formula, mm-hmm. you need to take them off a cow's milk formula and you need to put them onto a non cow's milk formula. And that you need to speak to your pediatrician mm-hmm. and do it under guidance of your pediatrician. And then you for two weeks, you give your baby a break of cow's milk protein. Okay. And by the end of those two weeks, they say it takes between 7 to 14 days for it to clear out of the system. Mm-hmm. Your baby still should become normal. The, the reflux should lessen. Um, the skin should start to clear up. If, if the cow's milk protein was the thing causing those symptoms in your baby, you should have a happier baby, mm. less gassy baby, less uncomfortable baby. And if that's the case, then you can almost be assured that your baby's got the cow's milk protein issue. Then the next part of the test is to reintroduce it. And that's the one the moms don't want to do. Because now you've got a happy baby, finally, who's sleeping. Now we ask mom to put it back in. But we Mm -hmm. do that for a reason. Because we never want to cut out unnecessary things out of a mom or baby's diet. Mm -hmm. So just in case it was coincidental that the baby maybe had a virus and was having all these symptoms, Mm. we want to just make sure and we ask mom to put it back in. Within three to seven days, the symptoms should return if the baby is cow's milk protein allergic. Okay. You can also do a blood test. That's often what the moms ask for. The blood test is only going to show you um, one type of allergy pathway. Mm. And if it comes back negative, it doesn't mean that your child isn't positive to cow's milk protein allergy. And that's where it can get very confusing. And I don't think we must go too much in detail of that. But Mm -hmm. I think just to say that the clinical exam, taking it away for two weeks, Mm -hmm. bringing it back after two weeks, is probably the most important part of the story. Mm -hmm. You can follow it up with the blood test and see is your baby a specific, if that allergy pathway is cow's milk protein allergy. Mm -hmm. If that's negative, but your baby showed remarkable improvement removing it out of the diet, but the blood test came back negative, it means that your baby is cow's milk protein allergic, but just a different pathway. Different protein. Yeah. One in 22. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Then what we do is we say to mom, keep your baby off cow's milk protein till six months, and then we can reintroduce it. Mm. If the blood tests come back positive, and show that your baby is cow's milk protein allergic via the blood test, Mm. you're probably looking at more two to five years that your baby could be allergic to cow's milk protein. Okay, so looking at the the sort of tests available, I've heard also the skin prick test, how um, effective are they compared to the the blood test and how soon can uh, mommies do it because babies can be quite young with the sort of symptoms that you've explained. So if we have a child that's really a struggle with allergies and we find that we've removed a lot of these these foods from mom's diet, Mm. the allergens, um, we might then request a blood test, especially when it comes to weaning Mm. before we go and introduce your more dangerous allergens like your peanuts and your egg and your fish. We might say if your child's shown a lot of allergic symptoms and been a real challenge to just milk feed, Mm. never mind anything else. We might suggest that your child goes and has the blood test. The skin prick tests we normally do when they're a bit older. Okay. Um, they are the, the accuracy is as accurate as the lab who's reading the skin prick test. So it's got a lot of error. And so we generally need to do it under your pediatrician and they mm-hmm. will advise you as to which lab is good and which lab can read them accurately because it's really can be quite subjective based on the size of the actual reactions like a wheel that we look at Mm. and we measure it from if the wheel is this big we say plus one if it's that big plus two if it's that big plus three Mm. um so and it can be a little bit subjective so um you get some amazing amazing labs that do a really good job with that some pediatricians even do it themselves and some of your allergists we get pediatric allergists and if your child is in that category where they are showing a lot of allergens Mm. and there are challenges to feed i would really recommend that you do 
um, speak to your pediatrician about possibly referring you to a specialist allergist. Um, but I think for now, the, the message for moms really is with the milk feeders is to establish is it a cow's milk protein mm. versus is it a lactose intolerance? And there's two, the test for lactose intolerance is very simple. If you don't have lactose in the stool, your child's not lactose intolerant. Okay. That's quite a simple one to rule out. Mm. If you do have lactose in the stool, just make sure that it's enough lactose to warrant removing it. And, and that's the only sort of test that doctors are, that's are it, using. Yeah, and obviously it strong. matches the symptoms. So if you're, for example, if your your baby's not thriving and your stools are extremely frothy and your baby's mm. got excessive diarrhea and there's lactose in the stool, then I say definitely remove lactose out of the diet. Okay. So, so that is um, all milk then. then? No matter it's breast milk. It would be, it be yes. Now you can get, for example, you can get formula. But you wouldn't be able to breastfeed. If your child was purely yeah. and primary lactose intolerance, you would have to stop breastfeeding. Mm. It's one of the rare cases where it would be dangerous to continue breastfeeding. Mm. Um, so you need to, you would then need to stop it and you would need to go into a lactose-free formula. You can get a cow's milk formula that's lactose-free. Okay. So they've just removed the lactose out of it and it works the very sugars. well okay. in children. It's exactly, they've removed the sugars and replaced them with other sugars. Mm. Your baby gets a complete feed but just the lactose sugar is gone. I still want to look at you know common um, food items that we find on the shelves, even for us moms that are breastfeeding, mm. not realizing that they've got milk in or Correct. milk solids exactly. or milk something exactly. in. So you say dairy, mm -hmm. um, you could be eating a biscuit that has hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, you, so, you can get it in so many items. Yeah. And words to look at are casein, okay. whey, um, cow's milk protein, um, cow's milk. Milk solids. Milk solids. Okay, yeah, so that. all of those will, will be indications that your child, well, that you need to remove mm. it if you're removing it from your diet. Our time is up. Uh, oh my goodness, I didn't realize. It's 30 quick. seconds for me just to wrap up. And, and, and I know mm. when you come back, we want to t mm. touch on it again, mm. just to you know recap. Milk and lactose intolerance, prim babies, nutrition, this is what we spoke about. And we'll have a, t a to be continued session when it comes to allergies. So please stay tuned um, to pregnancy, to parenting, and we will definitely to be continued allergies. But just quickly, um, on, on the scale of milk uh, mm. to moms, mess your message to moms. I think the most important thing is to make sure that you get the right diagnosis, mm. that if your baby's lactose intolerance, that you're, you and your pediatrician and your Healthcare professional, 100% sure, get the right test done mm. and make sure that it's sufficient evidence before you stop your breastfeeding. If your baby's fine with lactose and there's cow's milk protein issue, make sure that you do your clinical trial mm. before just being told it isn't or it is. Mm. Take it out of your diet if you're breastfeeding, change it to another formula if you're formula feeding, reintroduce it after two weeks and you will know. I love this quote by Maya Angela. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, you do better. Thank Lovely. you so much, Kath, for your time. We'll definitely see you back again soon. And we'll continue the allergy, nutrition, sufferer problem and eczema and all of that that comes in. We're going to talk about peanuts and I know we just discussed milk today, but so much more to come when we talk about nutrition. And like I said, it starts with you and you only know best at that moment and you can know a little bit better tomorrow there's also a great website i know of allergy essay with doctors um specialists that you can find to have that tests and also to seek advice but um, do seek advice from a professional first before you make any sort of changes thank you so much for staying with us i'm Khawa solomon in this edition of pregnancy to parenting see you again next time wassalamu alaikum and good day for now